Empress Without Memory, in which is shown that many brain circuits that help us see, hear, remember, speak and act are not necessary for consciousness. There are powerful machines inside the brain, and consciousness is wise to use them all. Some are for reading the features of the world, others for acting upon it. Most delicate are the machines that calculate and plan and counsel, and then machines that store the memory of events, though they are all just tools, not parts of consciousness itself. In front of Galileo was no machine. In front of him stood the lady who had bewitched his soul when he was young, and lured him many times to Venice. He said to her, Among the fair your learning is renowned, among the learned the glory of your fair looks, and both you conquer in study and beauty alike. In a mellow voice with studied poise she answered, A charming man you are, who with sweet words announces his desire. But be at ease, it is my sacred duty to attend to every poet. Me lady, you know the verse is yours, and yet with a noble modesty you feign indifference to praise. Dear Prince, for sure you must be one. Pray tell me who you are, and whence you come to me. I must have grown wizened and weary, me lady, if you don't recognize your humble suitor. Should I concede again that science should bow to poetry and present arms? Give me your secret watchword, and I shall tell you mine. Dear Prince, the gift of memory was stolen from my jewel box. One day I woke and I had lost my past. I live a recluse of the present, and in my house there is only one room. That cannot be, me lady. Your memory was the marvel of Venice, of poems and people alike. You knew by heart every secret sense. Not any more, Prince. Now every poem is singular to me. Each poem gives me new joy, though you will say I heard it many times. But love is pure when love is fresh, unburdened by the dust of memory. So a virgin pleasure I receive from all, from all who deign to visit my abode. Each time they shall have me for the first time. No dullness will set in, no weary custom. Each time anew discovering my prince, a trembling bride on her first night. How does it feel, me lady, not to remember, to hear the burning words of passion of your friend, to feel the mighty impression of his wish, and yet they leave no trace? I am not sure, she said. I argue a little with myself, and then she said, Perhaps it is like this. Like walking from a dream every time I wander. Alas, a dream from which I awake each moment of my life. Each time I feel I am alone. Every instant passes without a past. Floating amidst the river Leith, I can't behold its shores. And when I do come up to breathe, nothing for me to grasp. When I look back, nothing for me to see. Then tell me this, me lady. The heat of love, is it as ardent as it was before? The bite of pain or pleasure's beauty? Are they as intense when they are naked as when they are dressed in memory's weird garments? Do not importune her any more, said Frick, who had suddenly reappeared, taking Galileo away. Indeed, her memory of many events has vanished, and before long you would have made her cry. Something happened to her brain, deep in her temporal lobes. The hippocampus must have been destroyed. It is a thoroughfare that collects, at the end of tighter and tighter funnels of nerve fibers, the separate strands that make up every event of which we are conscious. One strand from each region of the cortex, and by collecting those strands in a single place, the hippocampus can weave them quickly together before they are dispersed so that we can recall the whole event at once. Freak went on. You have just seen your lady in a remote corner of the hospital, inside a room you never saw before. The hippocampus will weave a knot between that room and her lovely face and keep it tightly in store. So if one day you see that room again, the room will pull its strand in the hippocampus. 
that single strand woven together with that of her fair image will pull her up as well. Then through an inverted set of funneled strands, fanning out to reach the full width of the brain, the nodes in the hippocampus will call back their sources in the cortex and recall what was going on when that memory was formed. But now, the thread of all the past is lost to her. Galileo would not forget his lady's eyes, so he turned back, addressing her again. Me lady, confess me this, that your forgetfulness is the secret of your enduring beauty, that with the gods you have struck a pact, lest time would leave its mark on your fair body, it would not leave a mark on your swift mind. At which she said, I am not sure, for I am arguing a little with myself. And then she added, Dear prince, for sure you must be one. Pray tell me who you are, and whence you come to me. So Galileo let Frick lead him away. His thought was wandering along the hippocampus. Why was it so, he wondered, that despite loops made of a million strands, which tie the hippocampus with the cortex, the hippocampus does not partake in consciousness. The hippocampus is only a slave, one among many slaves of consciousness. What it can offer her is the power to remember and recall, answered Frick. Without her slaves, the empress has no clothes, is changed to an everlasting present. She sees, she hears, she feels and thinks, but cannot remember any event nor can she imagine novel ones. Imagination is the twin sister of memory. No, despite all those connections going both ways, the hippocampus does not partake in consciousness. Then Freak added, This is just one example. Many other loops leave the cortex, descend into the lower portions of the brain, attach to pigs and pulleys there, and return to the cortex. These wires and the pigs and pulleys to which they are connected are the bookkeepers of the cortex and run its skilled abacuses. They do the reckoning that the cortex needs, but are not lit themselves by the light of consciousness. Indeed, even within the cortex there must be many more such loops, which digest images and sounds, parse objects and words, and weave actions and sentences together. Galileo's expression was not one of persuasion, so Frick asked him, Tell me then, who invented the funnel of prime numbers? Galileo hesitated just briefly, and then his lips proffered the answer. I know, the sieve of Eratosthenes. How did you retrieve the sieve and the name? asked Frick. Think of it. You certainly heard the question in your consciousness, and then... And then consciousness pulled some strings in your brain, and lo and behold, the answer came to you, without you knowing at all what was going on. There it was, Eratosthenes, on a golden plate. These wires that loop from the top of the brain to the ganglia below, and then back to the brain, are the slaves of the mind. They promptly perform their duty, though they don't know what they do, nor why, nor for whom. They are blind, dumb, and mechanical and there are millions of them, as in the cerebellum. Without them, life would be an immense hurdle. Days would be spent tying your shoes and buttoning your jacket. And he guided Galileo into the next room. There it was, dark and quiet. But then the silence resounded of a single, low-pitched note. The note vibrating full and rich, etched out of stillness in great relief lasting suspended across time until it slowly disappeared into dead air the sound of a vile string time passed and stillness reigned again then another note lower pitched and dark reverberated through the room two breaths and then another note and then a pause that would not end what music is this why is the playing so slow? Galileo finally dared to ask. Freak whispered that the player was ill. Every act was slow and deliberate. What once was automatic, without effort or consideration, 
now requires conscious thought. Every act needs thought. No more scales rushing through the fingers, but only single notes. Every single note thought out in depth, decided as if it were the only one that can fill the compass of the present. Then a voice spoke slowly. Only the essential note is ever played. Every note in solitude, its whole life heard, with time enough to extinguish into silence. A candle was lit. A woman's shape emerged from the shadow, and Galileo knew who she was. Time had caught up with all his muses. Their suitor soon would be next in line. Already hand and thought had lost their nimble leap. One day, not even memory would stay behind to mourn. Notes The verse is from the Venetian poetess and renowned courtesan Veronica Franco. Galileo indeed used to visit Venice during weekends when he was a professor in Padua in order to have good time away from colleges and students. The plight of consciousness without memory was first revealed by the case of Henry M., a man whose hippocampi and neighboring structures were surgically removed in an attempt to relieve his seizures. His story is movingly told in Memory's Ghost by Philip Hiltz, 1995, Simon and Shuster. Henry did in fact often say, I'm having a little argument with myself. One should perhaps be more careful than freaking Galileo in dismissing any direct contribution of the hippocampus to consciousness. But their point is plausible. The portrait of Barbara Strozzi is by Bernardo Strozzi. Barbara, born in Venice, of a family connected to the Medicis, was one of the greatest musicians of her time and also perhaps a courtesan. Here she exemplifies the usefulness of unconscious modules to perform actions that can be made automatic.